Good evening. My name is Brian Devitt. I'm going to speak to you on staying on track with knee osteoarthritis, and this is with relevance to walking and hiking. So I want to first off show you a picture of a former patient of mine. This is a lady who's in her 70s, and we have embarked on a charity walk in Vietnam. So she had previously had a total knee replacement 18 months ago. So there's a few features I just want to point out. First of all, she's smiling. So she's doing very well following her knee replacement. Secondly, she's using a stick to help her get up what is a relatively steep slope. She's wearing the appropriate shoe wear. She doesn't have too much to encumber her in her uh, hike in terms of carrying a lot of load. And she's willing to help or receive help from the, uh, the, our guide who's bringing us along. So in Vietnam, we learned an awful lot of things. But one of the most important things we learned is some quotes from Confucius, who is a Chinese philosopher. And he told us, it doesn't matter how slow you go as long as you don't stop. And I think this is hugely relevant when it comes to the management of knee arthritis, but also activity in the setting of arthritis. It's really important that we keep on going. So we all come in different shapes and sizes. And it's the same with respect to our knees. We look here on the left side of the screen, we see what is a normal alignment, just two straight legs. We see a varus alignment or what we know as bow-legged in common parlance. And we also see a knock kneed or valgus alignment where on the, on the right-hand side of the screen. Now, all the people that come in, this, in these different shapes normally, but when it comes to pathology, we also see people develop these shapes of the knees as time goes on. And this is quite relevant in terms of how the weight when we walk goes through our knees. When we're in a neutral position, the weight goes directly in the middle of the knee, which is equally shared. In this bow leg position, the weight goes on the inside of the knee. And in this knock knee position, the weight goes on the outside of the knee. So this has an impact in terms of how we progress with wear and tear as life goes on. So I'm gonna show you a few um, picture examples or x-ray examples. And one of the things we use as orthopedic surgeons to diagnose arthritis, it's key to take the history from the patient as to where the pain is and when, it's, when it occurs, but an x-ray is very helpful. The most important thing about the x-ray is the person is standing. And we can see on both legs here that there's very little space on the inside of the joint, both of the right leg and of the left leg. And we refer to this as, as decreased joint space or also what is known as bone on bone osteoarthritis. So this happens in a situation where someone has bow legs. We also look at the kneecap and that's really important when it comes to walking because as you walk down the hills or down stairs or even upstairs, it puts a huge amount of stress through your kneecap. So it's really important that we would look at this and this kneecap is not too bad. It's got a little bit of decreased space, but there's plenty of life left in that yet. We often get patients referred to us with an MRI scan and MRIs will diagnose a lot of the soft tissue conditions, but we can also see arthritis. So I'm going to explain initially, we're looking at this MRI, is looking at your knee from the front. So this here is your kneecap, and we're gonna work our way towards the back. So anything that shows up as white on these scans indicates fluid or increased stress within the bone. I'm going to point that out as we go. So we'll work our way back through the MRI. It's a little bit shaky, so excuse me. And I'm looking at the fluid in the knees. We know that this knee is, is not in a great state. And we can see that the bone in this area on the inside of the knee is very white. And that indicates that this bone is under a huge amount of stress. And the reason it's under stress, and I'm going to go through that again, is because the meniscus, which is a shock absorber in the knee, has been damaged. You see this black structure is the meniscus, and you see it's being jettisoned out of the side of the knee. And underneath, you've no cartilage on this inside of the knee. And that's why a lot of people come to us thinking they have a meniscal tear. But in fact, the horse has long since bolted. It's arthritis is the situation. So this is how we see it on an MRI and the previous x-ray that we saw where you bone on bone arthritis is how we see it on an x-ray. So we do use all of these modalities to diagnose the injury and the presence of arthritis. This is another x-ray which shows arthritis not on the inside of the knee like previously, but on the outside. And you can see the shape of the leg is different from the normal leg, which is nice and straight. We see on the outside of the knee, you have wear and tear here with extra bone forming here in this region here. And you can see there's bone and bone arthritis on the outside of the knee. We look at this example of the kneecap. We see that there's a lot of extra bone around the kneecap and no space between the front of the kneecap and the femur. So this is an example of someone who has not only wear and tear on the outside of the knee, but also wear and tear on the front of the knee. 
So you imagine they're going to have an awful lot of pain walking downstairs, kneeling, uh, or any type of movement going from a seated to a standing position. So now we're going to uh, have a little bit of physics to understand why we have pain in the knee when we have arthritis and we walk. And physics, so I, this is a, a pictorial uh, example of Isaac Newton. So Isaac Newton discovered gravity, but he also discovered a lot of other important physics um, equations and theories. And one of the things that he recognized is that uh, gravity is a huge part to play, but also within the knee, as we, ex uh, we extrapolate that to the load going through our knees when we walk, it is very important. So if we look at just walking, the weight that goes through our knees, each individual knee when we walk is twice our body weight. When we walk downhill, that increases to four times our body weight. And if we were to run, that can go up to as much as eight times our body weight. So that's why if someone might be fine while standing, but when they walk, the pain increases. It's because the load going through the knee also increases. So let's do a small little calculation. So we'll take a hundred kilogram male. So that's a big man, maybe carrying a bit of extra timber. So with 100 kilograms, that person walks downhill, 400 kilograms goes to each individual knee with that action. Now, if he was to lose a moderate amount of weight, which is 10 kilograms or 10% his body weight, which would take a bit of effort, he would find that 40 kilograms less goes through each knee as he walks downhill. So this is very important to remember in terms of the loads that go through our knees when we walk, and also as a means of treatment for arthritis, it's very important. So in terms of the injuries we get while walking, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how to avoid injury to begin with. So you don't end up in my office at, at any time. The so first of all is knowing your limits. So when we start walking or if you've gone from a period of a sedentary uh, um, period to an active period, it's important that you go gradually. You don't go start hiking Mount Everest when you're just starting your, your walking. So it's very important to know your limits. I think that's one of the things we saw after COVID is when people were relatively sedentary, they went out to walking every day of the week. We did saw people with a lot of issues develop quite quickly. So if you're starting to walk, just start walking on the flat first. And if you want to then engage in some steps, that's appropriate if you've no pain, or then walk up and down hills as, as you see fit. It's often best to be preconditioned. So you want to improve your ankle strength and balance. And nowadays, we recognize that Pilates is really a great treatment for all types of ailments. And it's incredibly important with regard to improving your core strength, but also the strength of your, your quadriceps and hamstrings and also your ankles. If you, particularly when you see performer Pilates, these can be very effective as an all around holistic method to improve your strength and balance. We recognize hugely, as I saw in the picture at the start, is that the use of hiking poles is really important particularly when you're going up and down um, hills, because it allows you to take the load off the front of the knee and share it with the load in your arms. It, it also gives you an improved workout with your upper body. So using walk, walking poles is actually very, very sensible when it comes to hiking. So that's something we would recommend very much so. The use of appropriate footwear. So going hiking in a pair of sandals is not appropriate because you'll end up rolling your ankle or you'll load uh, inappropriately particularly on uneven ground and that tends to put increased stress through your knees or you got a little niggle there are some blisters that you'll try to you'll walk a bit more you walk differently and that puts increased load through your knees so that's a, a not a good wise thing to do is to wear inappropriate footwear and we recognize wearing properly fitted footwear with appropriate socks and trying to avoid getting the likes of blisters because they do change the, your gait and it's important that you try to maintain a normal gait that you equally distribute the weight throughout your knee and not in one certain area. And then just common sense, adequate or hydrate adequately. When you're tired or fatigued, you tend to stress our knees quite a bit more. So just have an appropriately distance walk so you're not very, very fatigued at the end of it or you're, you're um, walking in, uh, in, in, uh, incorrectly, which puts more stress to the front of your knee. So it's really important that your general health is well maintained as well. So let's just look at arthritis. Unfortunately, if you can't avoid injuries you may, and you do get some injuries with arthritis, how do we manage them? It's really important that you understand this. So I like this quote from Macbeth, and I've used it before in different talk, uh, talks, where it speaks of eye of newt and toad, frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm sting, lizard's leg and howlet's wing, for a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth, boil and bubble. We got the lighting to, um, to come on as well, give a bit more impact. 
But this is a, a, a quote from Macbeth, but none of these things work for osteoarthritis. You can rest assured you don't have to have any far-fangled uh, poisons or uh, potions to get you to, to, to uh, improve your arthritis. These things don't work. I oftentimes get patients coming into my room and they've consulted Dr. Google and they come in and say, well, this laser work, doctor. And really, I, I try to keep it very simple. There's a few tried and trusted things that work for arthritis. And I would uh, encourage you to, to follow the tried and trusted and not the, the, the far fangled uh, treatment. So these are the treatments that do work. So physical activity is important, just like the lady who's walking after a knee replacement, walking beforehand can be effective. But we try to avoid heavy load activities that put more stress to our knees. Weight loss is really probably one of the best treatments, but it's not an immediate uh, treatment to lose weight. So weight loss is very, very helpful as per Isaac Newton's uh, knowledge and uh, equations earlier on. Acupuncture has not been shown to work. Massage can be helpful for tight muscles. Bracing can occasionally be helpful and maybe a, a compressive brace can give you a bit more feedback in your knee. Insoles, likewise, have not been shown to be hugely helpful, but they do make footwear fit more appropriately. And glucosamine has not been shown to be extremely helpful, but it doesn't do much harm and it's cheap. So I wouldn't be overly against the use of glucosamine as an oral tablet. We then look at pharmacological treatment and we recognize that anti-inflammatories do work. So if you have swelling in your knee, it shuts down your muscles. So if we can get rid of that swelling, it allows your knee to function much better. A steroid injection um, can be helpful, particularly if you have swelling, but it's not, a, it's not a long lasting effect. It just has a short term effect. The use of hyaluronic acid in this um, uh, recommendation, and that's from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, has not been shown to be effective. It may be more effective in, in younger patients, but not in patients with bone and bone arthritis. And then platelet-rich plasma can be helpful in some circumstances, but it's not the go-to in every case. And then we look at surgery. So what's stuff that we do as, as surgeons? So washing the joint out with a camera, that is not effective. It used to be an old-fashioned treatment, but we don't do that anymore. Sometimes if people, even in the setting of arthritis, have a flipped piece of soft tissue like meniscus, remove that can give them um, some temporary relief, but it doesn't re remove the arthritis, it just removes the, the, um, the soft tissue, which might be impinging or getting in the way. Doing an osteotomy, which means cutting the bone and changing the shape of the leg, can be helpful in certain cases. And then a joint replacement has been shown to be very effective in the right setting at the right time. So one of the take home messages I always say to patients is your objective is to avoid people like me as long as you can. But when your arthritis gets quite severe, we are very helpful in terms of uh, relieving that pain and getting you back on track. So the effective method, just to reiterate, are weight loss, modify your activity. If you're doing things that are hurting you a lot, like walking downstairs or um, you know, walking down slopes, then try to avoid that as best you can. And um, it's also important to maintain the strength of your of your muscles and do so in a ma manner that doesn't hurt you so much. So doing the likes of cycling, Pilates, swimming, if you have advanced arthritis, can be very good to maintain your motion. The use of anti-inflammatory medication is very important. There's a limited role for arthroscopy and knee replacement when ready. And when I tell patients they're, they know they're ready when they pain at night or pain at rest, that really affects their quality of life. And that's really important. So I'm just going to give an example of this is a knee replacement. So this is one of the ladies earlier on who had the wear and tear to the outside of the joint and the front of the knee. And this is what we did. We gave her a knee replacement. And this lady was back walking and hiking. And um, it's not quite the picture of the one woman I saw at the front, but very similar back to a very active quality of life. We see how straight we get the leg afterwards. And this is replacing the kneecap that was extremely badly worn with a uh, resurfacing of the kneecap or patella as we talk about. So it allowed her um, to walk downstairs without any major problems. We also sometimes just replace one part of the joint. So on this right leg here, we see the inside part of the joint has uh, arthritis and decreased joint space and extra bone here. And in this case, we just replace this side because the rest of the side was relative, relatively well maintained and allows patients to get back to a very good level uh, of function very quickly after surgery. So patients often ask me, how active can I be with a knee replacement? And I often remember a patient of mine who was a, a farmer from an area in Victoria when he was working in Australia called Gippsland. And I remember this patient came in and he came at six months following surgery. 
And I asked him, did his knee hurt? And he said, occasionally it hurt. I said, when does it hurt? He said, well, after shearing 50 sheep, it became a little bit painful. And he told me a very good quote, which I often tell patients when I see them in the clinic. And what this said, he said was, I quickly realized that it, it was a case of my knee getting used to me and not me getting used to my knee. So this is a real paradigm shift in my mind in that when you have a knee replacement, just go off and do what you want to do. If you molly coddle that knee and if you don't move it, your knee will be sore, sore and stiff. You could often do what you want to do, whether it's um, cycling, whether it's playing tennis, whether it's surfing, whether it's shearing sheep, just do what you want to do and your knee will follow suit. So I'm very happy to take some questions later on and I hope you get back on track with knee arthritis. Thank you very much. Brian, right, really interesting talk uh, and loads of questions coming in. So let's kick off. First question from Trina, why do I have discomfort in my groin while walking? Um, well, it's quite common to get groin pain while walking. Um, I suppose it depends on the patient's age, but typically if someone has pain, it's either a muscular um, injury or strain or it can relate to arthritis. It's a very common site to get arthritis um, within the groin. Um, it's typically a pain that comes on after exercise and as it gets more severe, you can get it at rest or at night and that's when you really should have something done about it. Um, question from Anne, should, is walking stick helpful with hip issues for walking? Yeah, walking stick can be, um, can be very helpful. Essentially, it's typically used in the, the opposite hand and it essentially offloads some of the weight going through the hip. Um, the muscles that are attached to the side of your hip um, really undergo quite a bit of stress uh, when you have arthritis because the, the joint is irritable. And this is a, an ability to offload that by using the walking stick but on the opposite hand, typically. OK, so I'm just going to go to one then about the walking poles. Are they a good idea? Yeah, for the same reason, walking poles are an excellent idea. Um, in, in People tend to use two poles nowadays. I know the picture I showed at the start yeah. of my talk was just the solitary pole, but if you use two poles, I think they're referred to as Nordic uh, walking, um, where they use two poles is great because you are able to, particularly going uphill, but also going downhill, you're able to take some of the load off the front of the knee. So you use your arms to push you up and you keep the stick and uh, quite vertical and it allows you to exercise your upper body, but also offload the knee and takes a lot of the stress off the front of the knee and makes it somewhat easier. Lovely. Uh, from Nolan, how influential do you find excess weight has with the level of general inflammation in the body and when it comes to pain with osteoarthritis? Well, as, uh, as I referred to with uh, Isaac Newton and the importance of gravity and weight, weight is hugely important in terms of the, um, the load going through a joint. So not just your knee joint, but all your joints of your body. So if you're carrying excess weight, uh, you will put a significant amount of weight uh, multiple times your weight through, through that joint. Um, in terms of excess weight and inflammation, I think the excess load is going to give rise to further inflammation within your joint. Um, I know there's further studies that probably have looked at obesity and inflammation in general, but specifically with the joint, it's very much the load that goes through the joint causes the irritability. Yeah. Um, what is the best type of knee support to wear, or would you recommend support or not? Um, knee supports can be helpful in certain circumstances. I think um, you, know, you can go from very fancy braces which offload one particular compartment of the knee and they can be somewhat awkward to wear but can be effective to a simple sleeve which essentially can give some feedback or what we call proprioception is where you know knowing where your joint is in space and sometimes you have swelling in a knee using a compression dressing or sorry compression um, uh, sleeve is very effective um, but they, there is no proven evidence that they're going to reduce the uh, the progression of arthritis, they just make you feel a bit better during exercise sometimes. Okay. A similar kind of question from Fiona. She's asking about jumper straps of pain in the knee. Um, find that she still gets the pain whether she uses it or not. So would it be better that she just doesn't use it or why would that be? Yeah, I, I think she, uh, the jumper strap refers to the strap that just goes at the uh, bottom and where your patellar tendon attaches to your tibia. That's where I see it frequently. Um, you know, I think the whole idea is of trying to offload the, the tendon somewhat and to take the stress off it. And um, really just using common sense, if it's not that effective, I'd stop using it, to be honest with you, and 
and maybe have to look a bit more deeply into the problem. Someone is asking, what's your view on stem cell injections for osteoarthritis and the knee? Um, I just think we're not there yet. I think realistically with stem cells, they, they offer a, a you know, great possibility perhaps in, 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 in terms of the management of, of arthritis, but we really don't have the answers yet. I'd follow the research quite closely on this issue and really we don't have the evidence to support the use of, of stem cells. One of the things which is very interesting, some of the guidelines from Australia where I worked um, previously, they said that you shouldn't really be involved or go to someone who is delivering stem cells without it being involved in a randomized control trial. And you'll find that most of the people who supply stem cells are doing so for a commercial gain. It's not based on research or evidence. So I would say beware uh, in those circumstances because you can find yourself out of pocket a lot without any proven evidence it works. Question here from Valerie. She said, thank you for the very clear presentations, but um, my iPhone asymmetry. Do you think it's reliable data? How important are those things? Yeah, I think the use of uh, iPhones or what, what's referred to as disruptive technology is, is very interesting and quite promising. I think that most people now have uh, some form of iPhone or a watch, a smartwatch, and it allows us to be able to uh, monitor our steps. Um, I know there's some great uh, research coming out of the DCU uh, in the Health and Human Performance School, and they're looking at the use of iPhones with runners and with walkers and just to monitor their steps, but also an ability to monitor injury or certainly low load injury to see if that progresses to more serious injury. So I think watch this space is what I'd say. I think the, the technology is improving. Great. Helen said, is it possible to get back to walking and hiking after bilateral hip surgery? Yes, absolutely it is. Yeah, um, I think you know, hip surgery Nowadays, we get people back to a very good level of function and both hips, there's no reason you can't get back to it. I think one of the things you have to is do firstly is get your normal gait pattern and uh, improve that following surgery because it can take some time. But definitely get back to activities and start on a flat and then increase the inclination and then go to um, hikes, more difficult gradients as time goes on. But there's no reason you can't. Um, Lady Gronia has osteoarthritis in both knees. Uh, does hill walking make this worse or is it OK to continue? Well, I think you know, hill work, walking is going to put more load through an arthritic knee. So it's probably going to make the pain somewhat worse. I think, once again, just using your common sense, if you can maximise your, your potential in terms of keeping your body weight down, recognising that your knee, if your knee is swollen or very sore, you're probably best not going for a, a long walk because you'll be in further pain that evening. But if you're managing okay, and if you can um, alter the gradient accordingly based on your symptoms, I think you can continue walking. But also be aware that, don't, don't be foolish about it. If your knees are hurting you, that you can't get a good night's sleep, there is a solution for that. And that's something that I would seek you know, professional advice um, from a GP, physiotherapist, and ultimately a surgeon if, if that is deemed, is deemed well warranted. Okay. Uh, Linda say, what causes creaking in the knees and can be anything be done to eliminate it? So creaking is very common uh, in, in knees and it, it's, it's, it increases with age as well. I think one of the things we recognize is people sometimes describe this crunching at the front of the knee, particularly going up and down stairs or getting up from a seated position. And what I um, make the analogy, it's like having two pieces of Velcro and those pieces being um, put together. So you get the intertwined fibers of the Velcro. And as you pull them apart, you get a, a crunching sensation with the increased friction. And that happens exactly the same in your knees. You have two pieces of cartilage. The cartilage becomes soft and the cartilage interdig interdigitates with the cartilage on the front of your knee, the kneecap cartilage with the front of your knee. And that's what gives you that kind of crunching sensation. So crunching in and of itself is part, it's just, I suppose, heralds the fact that you have soft cartilage, it's not necessarily a bad thing if it's not hurting, but it probably is going to progress to painful um, knees ultimately. But once again, as I said, the same advice applies. Keep the body weight down, keep your activity up, keep your strength level good. Question here from Emily. Uh, she said she's got knee arthritis, osteoarthritis. She has lost five stone in weight and she does a lot of walking. She wants to start jogging. Is this safe to do or will she do more damage to her knee? It does ache after a brief jog. 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's a fantastic achievement, first of all, losing five, five uh, stone. That's, uh, that equates, as I said, to when she's jogging, uh, that equates to 40 stone less yeah. through each knee when she jogs. So that's an amazing achievement. I think, you know, it depends on what her, what her baseline weight is to start with. I think that, um, you know, jogging is going to put more load through your knee, so it may cause more pain. Um, but equally, then you can look at different types of jogging. If you jog, um, you can do aqua aerobics. Aqua jogging can be helpful. That takes your body weight away immediately. But doing some short jogs, um, starting off at short distance and progressing up. And don't do them day after day. If you want to do them maybe on a weekend or a short park run or something, that might be a good goal to set. But really just monitor her symptoms with time. And at the end of the day, you, you'll, you'll, your body will tell you if you're overdoing it, ultimately. Okay. Uh, question from Veronica. She's got had cartilage repair previously. Now having problems with the knees again. She's had cortisone. She's awake in MRI. She's asking, is knee surgery inevitable or can pain successfully be managed by exercise? And is it okay to then to continue with the walking or hiking or will it cause prolonged problems? Now you've answered some of that there. But is it, I mean, talk about how she can manage it with exercise probably. Well, I, I think, you know, knee surgery is certainly not, um, not obligatory and it's not inevitable uh, for every patient at all. And in fact, I tell patients to avoid me as long as they can. And there is a fantastic, you know, sort of group of um, physiotherapists and exercise physiologists who give exercise prescription and they give a really bespoke treatment for um, for knee arthritis and that they deal with all of the issues, as I mentioned, in the, the, the factors that work. So they'll help you with your weight loss. They'll give you exercise that don't that doesn't cause pain. They'll recommend specific um, you know, strengthening exercise that you can manage and they'll get you doing social exercise because it's very good, not for our physical health, but for our mental health as well. So as I said, uh, surgery is certainly not inevitable. You know, as the conditions progress, surgery may be helpful, but I would recommend people avoid it for as long as they can when it comes to knees. Yeah. Uh, question from Len. Len, uh, he does have bone on bone knee issues uh not bad enough he says for surgery yet he struggles to hill walk he manages the gym three days a week knee is obviously still not improving any advice on getting back to the hill walking yeah it's 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 a difficult scenario i think you know i suppose we we're on a hill walking webinar now so yeah. i'm not going to diss it but hill walking does put a reasonable load for your knee yeah if, if you're having a lot of pain you have bone or bone arthritis and the hill walking is affecting your quality of life. Maybe doing something else in the hills, like cycling might be better for the time being, um, but you really should seek kind of advice if, if, if you can do something to help you get back to, to hill walking and that may require surgery, that might be what you're looking for. And there's lots of procedures we do. I think, as I mentioned in my talk, not all knee surgery relates to total knee replacement. We do partial knee replacements. We can do osteotomies where we put the bone. So getting a, a, a consultation and having an assessment is probably the first step in getting back on the trails, I would say. Okay. Uh, bursitis, I've um, ischial bursitis, which is worse after hill walking and, the, and very uncomfortable when I sit down. Any advice? Yeah, so ischial bursitis relates to the sit bone, as they talk about in, uh, in Pilates. It's where the bone on the back of your pelvis, where your hamstrings are attached. And typically, ischial bursitis goes hand in hand with uh, hamstring tendon tendonitis or tendinopathy. And it's not uncommon to get in runners or, or in hill walkers because you're in that flexed um, spine position, which puts a lot of strain on the top of the hamstring. So uh, sometimes it, it just requires rest um, or strengthening of the gluteal muscles. Uh, other times it might herald a tear, which can occur as we age. Uh, and sometimes it can tear so much that the hamstring pulls off. And that's a situation that may require intervention. But an MRI scan is normally able to diagnose that pretty well. Um, yeah. And really, the, the early treatment is mostly strengthening. I've got three questions here about knee replacement. One, some of them are asking about the success of the knee replacement. And there's someone else about the, how long rehab takes after the knee replacement. I think the two of them maybe some tie in together as well. And is it possible to get back to running after the knee replacement? Yeah. So I suppose let's deal with the first one first. Uh, how successful knee replacement? It's, it's very successful for the vast majority of people. And um, if you take 100 people who have knee replacement, you'll find 85 to 90 
percent of those people will be very happy. Uh, you'll find that probably um, five to ten percent will have some lingering pain, and you'll find five percent of people probably won't be happy. Will have ongoing pain, and typically those people who have ongoing pain, either their condition is not solely related to their knee, um, or perhaps um, you know they they just haven't rehabilitated properly. They've got stiffness afterwards. Um, in terms of um, your rehabilitation following a knee replacement. Typically, you're, you're using crutches for the first six weeks or so, and then you're weaning off the crutches. You're getting back to driving typically at that time. Um, people tend to have some discomfort at night up to three months. But before you're back to your normal level acti of activities, it's probably in the region around three to six months. And before you recognize it or you forget you've even had a knee replacement, it can be up to 12 months following surgery. Um, and then can you get back to running? Um, yes, if you wish, um, you know, we wouldn't recommend you run an ultra marathon after knee replacement because it's going to wear out with more activity. Um, but you could certainly get back to kind of a little bit of a jog if you wished. But most people are, are kind of happy just to be able to do their regular activities. Um, it wouldn't be the best exercise running. We'd rather you do swimming or cycling. Um, but if you wanted to play tennis and stuff like that or um, ski, that's, that's fine too. We don't mind. Can long-term knee problems cause back pain? Yes, they can, yeah. Um, unfortunately, with long-term knee problems, you tend to get a greater level of deformity. So one of the things you recognize the early signs of arthritis is you can't get your knee fully straight. And if you can't get your knee fully straight, you tend to stand with a, a more flexed posture of your hip, which puts uh, more stress in your lower back. So that can also cause some lower back issues. So it really has a knock-on effect, um, not in, just in terms of your gait, but also your stance, and it has an effect on your back. I was just asking here, how long does a knee replacement last? Is it for life? And I suppose that depends on how old you are when you have it as well. So. Yeah, so I was at a, a conference uh, recently and, and I was put to one of the speakers and he probably answered the best I've heard. It said there's a, probably a 1% failure rate of a knee replacement per year It's after it's been inserted. So if you have a knee replacement in uh, for 20 years, there's an 80% chance you'll still have that knee and 20% chance you might require a a, a uh, revision so the one of the reasons as i said we have to earn your knee replacement we try to avoid it for as long as we can especially in young people because young people are going to use their knee more therefore they're going to wear it out more and therefore they're more likely to have a revision at a younger age but i think our our thoughts on this have, we're, we're kind of realistic as well that we 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 recognize that knee replacement is a good procedure we want to avoid it as long as we can but equally, life is for a living. And if people have an awful lot of discomfort and can't play with their kids or can't do things that they want to do, we do have a solution, but we have to be very selective in terms of we, we choose and we have to make sure people are very aware that it might require revision at a later stage. Yeah. And Brian, um, so Helen here, she's got a torn ACL. Um, she, doesn't think she wants to go through surgery um, and recovery. Is there evidence that she may end up with arthritis in the future? She's 55, very fit, and uses the gym regularly. So unfortunately, with an ACL tear or rupture, there is evidence that, yes, you're at a greater risk of developing osteoarthritis. I think more pertinent is, is the status of the cartilage, so not just your articular cartilage, which is the hard cartilage, but especially the meniscus, which is the soft cartilage, the shock absorber between your knee. Um, so if that is injured, that does increase the risk of arthritis. There is no evidence necessarily that doing an ACL reconstruction is going to reduce your risk of arthritis, um, but it does stand to reason that if it protects the menisci, then it can be protective in long term. But if it uh, depends on what uh, this lady's um, uh, physical activity is in terms of which, what she wants to do. She's going to do sports or activities that require pivoting. She And she is unstable, but she has a subjective feeling that her knee is going to give way. She may benefit from intervention, but if she's not, then she could very well be very um, content without an ACL reconstruction and do extremely well. Okay. Uh, Gorn is just asking, is there an assessment you can get to examine the state of your knees and legs generally for returning to walking? Um, and general level of fitness before they start again and maybe play tennis. So I suppose, what, how do they get their knees assessed? Yeah, well, there's you can do that through a number of means. I think one of the facilities which I think is fantastic is in the sports medicine department and um, at the sports surgery clinic. 
and they have a whole series of strength and conditioning coaches that do some objective strength testing and bring you through some um, um, flexibility assessment. They look at your running gait. They look at various different factors and they can give you advice and strength and conditioning. If they feel it's necessary, they can refer you on to a physiotherapist or refer you on to one of the sports medicine physicians and they can organize some imaging as well. So it's a one-stop shop in terms of looking at your general health and your general fitness and improving it. So I think that would be a great place for that person to go. Brian, thanks very much for joining us this evening. If anyone has any questions or wants to make any appointments, they can just hit the tab um, and you will get the link or phone number to ring or the email address and we will come back to you. Um, thank you again for joining us and our future events are on the website. Thank you.